Picture this, it's November of 2004. You've been playing Kingdom Hearts since it first released two years ago. It took you a long time to beat the game because you were a 6-7 to seven year old who was trash at video games and you were also kinda scared of some parts of it. This is you, not me, of course. But thanks to the generosity of family members either helping you beat Captain Hook or being in the room with you while Ansem talked to Sora in the secret place, and again, this was your experience, you eventually managed to beat the game. Most kids would probably move on to something else, but you were immediately ready to relive the experience over and over again. Piles of other PS2 and GameCube games at your disposal, and yet you were just drawn back to Kingdom Hearts. Thankfully, this was just a phase that would only last a minimum of 18 years. One day after school, you're doing some homework, crushing this week's spelling words, naturally. A wall-mounted TV is playing in the background at a low volume as you perfect the crucial skill of cursive handwriting. You're making quick work of Mrs. Stout's assignment, who is actually quite petite, and that's when you hear it. Hear what, you might be asking yourself about your own memory. Your mom? The president? God? No, think higher. It's Utada Hikaru serenading you with simple and clean through the television. You think to yourself, that's odd, why would there be a commercial for Kingdom Hearts on? The game's been out for years. But you turn to look at the screen and realize this is something new entirely. The characters are all sprites. There are little squares with numbers on them all over the screen. This worried you because you were much better at spelling than math, don't ask me how I know that. There's a sad looking blonde girl, Sora, Donald, and Goofy running in the field from the end of the game, and holy shit, is that a Riku health bar? And then it hits you. A new game. Suddenly, the game you knew and loved on the PlayStation 2 wasn't Kingdom Hearts, it was Kingdom Hearts 1. Because as the deep-voiced man on the picture box just said, Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories is coming to stores this holiday season. Fast forward to Christmas Eve, after an agonizing wait that endured long past the release date because I was a child with exactly zero dollars to my name, I mean, you were, you finally got your hands on the game, courtesy of Grandma. Look at you and your dad, he's like, what the heck is that Kingdom of Hearts? That night, you would begin your journey through Castle Oblivion, the setting for one of the most underrated and intriguing entries in what would eventually become a massive franchise. Chain of Memories is not the best game in the series. It's not the most fun to play, but I do think it might be the smartest. And to be clear, while I think it's not the best Kingdom Hearts game, I still think it's much better than it has any right to be. Let's just stop and think about what this game is. A follow-up to a voiced 3D game on a technically inferior system and a handheld one at that. Remember how Kingdom Hearts 1 had that fun and flashy combat system and a bunch of geographically interesting worlds to explore? Well, forget all that. What if we gave you a shitload of cards and you fought by essentially playing war with each attack you throw out? Also, those 3D environments sure were neat, but how do you feel about generating pseudo-random dungeons? By the way, there's a bunch of pretty important stuff in this game, so I hope you didn't plan on skipping it. Yeah, this should have been a disaster. In fact, some of you might think it is a disaster based on how I just described it. In fairness, I framed it as negatively as possible for the exercise. But I think it succeeds in spite of all these drastic changes and gameplay shifts. I should note, the footage I'm using here will be entirely from the game's remake, but I'm mostly going to be talking about the game as it was initially presented, since that's how I initially experienced it. On my trusty, indestructible, red Game Boy Advance SP. I think it's important to remember how the game was originally intended to be played, since that's going to inform certain things about the PS2 remake that would come out a few years later, sometimes for better and sometimes for worse. To start off, I want to posit my theory as to why Chain of Memories tends to get lost in the shuffle, pun heavily intended. It's the gameplay. Nobody prefers it to the style employed by the mainline games, and I would imagine most people still prefer the command deck style of Birth by Sleep and Dream Drop. And I'm not going to sit here and act like another run-of-the-mill, enlightened, contrarian YouTuber and say that I just don't understand how you plebeians don't get it. I don't fault anyone for holding the opinion I described, in fact, I hold it myself. And if a game's core gameplay is what weighs heaviest for you in judging a game's quality, I wouldn't fault you for that either. After all, the factor that separates a video game from other forms of media is the interactivity. If you don't enjoy how you interact with a game, it's understandable if the story, characters, music, and visuals can't save the experience for you. I am inclined to agree with that notion on most occasions. But while I tend to enjoy the Chain of Memories combat system less than the other entries, that isn't to say that I don't enjoy it at all. I don't think it's bad, I just think it's different. I think it's perfectly serviceable and even above replacement level as far as combat on a Game Boy Advance game goes. Because, again, to circle back to the concept of having a portable Kingdom Hearts game in 2004, it's hard for me to be too mad at what the game is going for here. Maybe it didn't have to be a card system, but then maybe it's just kind of a bland 2D hack and slasher. Admittedly, one thing I will hold against the game is that I never really understood why everything boils down to cards. I understand it as a gameplay mechanic and as a way to give the player something to collect, but in-universe, I don't recall it ever being explained exactly why Castle Oblivion requires attacks and friends and entire worlds to be represented via playing cards. Maybe I'm thinking too hard about it, but I always like it if a game can contextualize its gameplay elements. Putting that aside, I think if Kingdom Hearts started out on the GBA and always employed this style of combat, it A, probably would not have become as big of a phenomenon as it is, but also B, the combat wouldn't be as frowned upon because there'd be nothing else in the series to compare it to. 
I don't intend to speak for everyone, but I know most of the frustration I'd ever had with Chain of Memories combat is that it was tantalizingly close to what I knew and loved from KH1, but not quite there. Especially in the case of Recom, which looks a lot like the first game, but plays entirely differently. But my frustrations were never with the combat system itself, because on its own, I think it's decently clever, and while it can be broken and manipulated in the same way the other handheld titles can, I think it's not as easily done in Chain of Memories. I mean, Sonic Blade and Recom specifically is definitely OP, but I would rank it below Dream Drops, Balloons, and Birth by Sleep's Mine Attacks. That all being said, and maybe this is a hot take, but I think playing through Chain of Memories casually your first time will require a lot more active thought than a playthrough of any other game in the series. I say casually because I understand that Proud or Critical Mode optional bosses in any of the other games can require a lot more mental energy than anything Com has to offer, but I'm talking on the whole. When you're playing through Com the first time, you are almost by default going to be thinking a lot harder and have to make more decisions than you would on your first run of Cage 1, 2, or 3 from start to finish, especially on the mid to lower difficulties that I think a decent portion of the audience first plays the games on. And I'll say this as someone who is obviously a huge proponent of these games, but a lot of them can be fairly mindless as far as combat goes until you're playing at those higher levels. Chain of Memories can certainly get a little more mindless once someone learns how to game the system a bit, but I think it requires a bit more thought and effort to comfortably get to that point, especially for a first-time player without access to the best strategies in 2004. Learning the ins and outs of the system is half the game in Chain of Memories. I should reiterate, I'm not attempting to justify that Chain of Memories is better at handling combat than the other games just because it might ask a bit more of you. If you don't like how it feels or don't want to think about selecting the right card or ordering your deck the right way, then none of that really matters. But for the people who do like the deck building and strategic elements of the game, and it ended up growing on me, you might find the change of pace to be a bit more enjoyable. With all this in mind, and again, I don't know if I'm treading into hot or cold take territory here because I hardly ever see people talk about Chain of Memories, but I think the GBA version is a better game than Recom. Now, if you're getting someone into the series and handing them the HD collection, should they ignore Recom and play the GBA version? No. It's a weird little conundrum. As an experience, Recom is providing you 3D models and voiced cutscenes, at least during the juicy parts, and even new content and boss battles. It's hard not to call it the definitive version, and yet I find myself struggling to reconcile that with GBA Com being the better version. Or maybe I should say GBA Com is the more justifiable version. When translated to a 3D space, the battles are less interesting and easier to break, the quote-unquote exploration is less excusable, and the huge chunks of unvoiced dialogue and reused Disney content become all the more glaring. This doesn't make me hate Recom, but what were once understandable limitations on GBA become head-scratchers when translated to PS2. But therein lies the problem with remaking a game, especially when undergoing such a dramatic leap in hardware capabilities. How much of this do we update and fix, assuming we even want or care to, and how much do we keep the same in order to stay faithful to the original? But as it stands, Recom really is just a GBA game with a PS2 coat of paint, and it would appear that this disguise rarely ever fools anyone because it plays exactly like that sounds. I don't remember what PS2 Recom initially retailed for, but I hope it wasn't the full 50 dollars that I remember being standard for PS2 games, and to be honest, anything above 30 bucks would be a pretty big ask. Because when compared to its contemporaries or even games that came out a full six years earlier on the same system, Recom just doesn't stack up. As a standalone experience, you can't sell this at the same price that 1, 2, or something like a Final Fantasy X or a GTA went for. In fact, you ought to sell it for a good amount cheaper. I hate this. I know I was pretty hard on the game just now, which is definitely at odds with the video title, but that really is mostly directed at Recom the game, not Chain of Memories the experience. Did that sound pretentious enough? That is to say, I think the gameplay flaws of Recom cast a bit of a shadow over Chain of Memories as a full package. Again, for the purposes of this video, I'm looking through the lens of an initial GBA playthrough in 2004. And to be honest, I started this script not even planning to touch on the gameplay all that much in either version, mostly because it's just not the aspect of the game I'm most interested in, I just kind of fell into talking about it. But as willing as I am to give the calm gameplay a fair shake, and even find myself enjoying it from time to time, it's honestly always just been a means to an end for me. The means being the gameplay, and the end being the story. Some games are like that for me, even despite what I said about the process of actually playing a game being pretty damn important. For a few examples of the inverse, and just for the sake of fleshing out what I mean here, series like Pokemon or Assassin's Creed eventually turned into the means being the end. Young Pat played Pokemon Emerald with a genuine curiosity for the region of Hoenn and the mythos of the legendary Pokemon, and catching and battling was fun too. Old Jaded Pat played Pokemon Sword because catching and battling is fun, but he's also half checked out and listening to a podcast the entire time because everything else is kinda garbo. Young Pat played Assassin's Creed 1 through Brotherhood completely sucked in by the wacky modern plotline and it was also very fun to stab people. Old Jaded Pat played Black Flag or Odyssey because stabbing people has remained a time-honored unmatchable thrill, but the overarching story ended up being neglected and sometimes flat-out abandoned by the game's creators, and so Old Pat followed suit. The means and the ends stopped being equally as compelling. 
Chain of Memories as an idea has always been interesting to me because I've long held it in relatively high regard even despite the ends always being ten times more interesting to me than the means. And sometimes a game only needs to excel in one area and at least perform decently in another in order for me to deem it a generally positive experience. Basically, I rank games weirdly, I get it if you think I'm off my rocker, you do you. Let's get to what I really want to talk about. As a standalone game, I don't think any other entry in the series matches the level of intrigue that Chain of Memories imparts. I was so genuinely engrossed in Calm when I first played it. For nearly the entire playthrough, the game kept me theorizing and on my toes, and it fully motivated me to continue my quest through the castle. I've heard Calm's detractors say that the game just speaks at you in nonsensical riddles for most of the runtime before cluing you into what's going on, but I think that's kind of a bad faith observation. Well, take as much umbrage with the laws of Kingdom Hearts physics and its mythos as you want, if the heart, light, dark, memory, friendship stuff doesn't appeal to you, then Calm and the rest of the series will likely fall flat. But if you're down with the rules of the universe, I don't think it's fair to say that the game is just saying nonsense to you or that it never makes sense when viewed in hindsight. I mean, it's a mystery, that's kind of what mysteries do. If the game was crystal clear with you about what's happening and its characters were fully transparent about their true intentions, then that's not much of a mystery, at that point you're just climbing some stairs. Whereas a game like Dream Drop Distance, in my opinion, is tripping over itself and usually doing a poor job at explaining its most confusing aspects between sleeping worlds and time travel, Chain of Memories has always felt much more aware that it's confusing and frustrating. The difference between the two games is the kinds of questions I was asking after I had finished its campaigns. Dream Drop had me asking questions about what was coming next, but mainly about what I had just experienced. How did X do Y, or why exactly does Z work? Chain of Memories didn't really leave me with any retrospective questions, just speculation about the future. I want to take a look at why Chain of Memories succeeds, at least for me, in being narratively and thematically captivating from start to finish. Aside from the obvious aspects that we've already covered, what is it about this entry that makes it so unlike any other, especially when it comes to its tone and atmosphere? Well, first and foremost, I think this is the darkest game in the series. And no, I'm not forgetting about moments like the ending of Days or Birth by Sleep, but that's just what those are. Moments. Chain of Memories is consistent and unrelenting in how it fucks with both Sora and the player. Even the shift in gameplay style is disorienting for the player and debilitating for the characters. Donald can't use his magic, and Sora can't use the skills he learned last time out. But most importantly, this game lies to you. That sounds like a bad thing, but I tend to forgive that kind of transgression if I learn the truth before the game ends. Keep me in the dark even after the credits roll, that's a different story. But for most of the first game, everyone's intentions were pretty clear. Ansem is operating behind the scenes, but it's fairly evident what he wants to do once he shows up in the flesh. The only real secret that's kept from us is the whereabouts of Kairi's heart, which was never so much a lie as it was just a lack of information. This is not the case in Castle Oblivion. For one, the castle itself. We're told from the very beginning that this castle has certain dark, magical properties that cause people who climb it to lose their memories bit by bit, which, even as a lie, is a fascinating idea to me. I felt a kind of morbid curiosity to see just how far gone our heroes would be by the time they reached the top. In addition to that, you're kind of motivated to keep going both as a player and as someone climbing the castle because if you turn back, then what was it all for? It's not really a case of sunk cost fallacy because anything but full commitment to getting to the top means you permanently lose a part of yourself for no payoff or benefit at all. On top of this, we're teased with the idea that Castle Oblivion also has the power to uncover these hidden subconscious memories. As Larkseen notes, the idea is that you're essentially having these base level memories stripped away in order to reawaken these supposed true memories that lie underneath. And again, this is all a lie. If you or I got sucked into a GBA comm cartridge and our pixelated likenesses trudged up the castle, we'd be just fine. I would remember my friends and family, and unfortunately the time I cried during a math test in 6th grade because I studied so hard and was still so dumb, or all of the nauseatingly cutesy text conversations I had with my high school ex-girlfriend. I don't know about you, but I would honestly feel a bit cheated that I had to keep remembering all of it. But the reason you and I would retain our memories is because, one, the castle has nothing to do with it, and two, we don't have a connection to Sora. Or at least I don't think we do. You and I may be the only people who don't. Enter Namine, or Namine if you're an 8 year old who doesn't really understand the power of an acute accent. Namine is an unwilling pawn, responsible for the manipulation of Sora's memories, going so far as to not only erase memories of his past, but supplant them with false ones at the behest of a couple of friendly fellows in black coats. We'll get to them soon. Since I just wasn't expecting the game to be lying to me, I fully bought into this fake-ass idea that Sora had forgotten about this other girl from the island. Granted, I was a child and perhaps didn't notice that it was pretty convenient how Sora happened to forget about Kyrie right around when those Namine memories started flooding in. But I mean, we'd seen the party forget about Hollow Bastion, so we knew that they were losing other memories too, and these revelations about Namine were in line with the whole idea of uncovering these deeply buried memories, so it seemed plausible to me. And then you've got Riku, whose brain has been so fried by the castle, he's completely forgotten how we squashed our beef at the end of the last game. In fact, he's forgotten so hard, he tries to kill us four times. Not exactly a fan of the repetition there, as an aside. But eventually we come to find out that he seemingly has the same hidden memories that Sora does, which is obviously an indicator that everything is not what it seems. Oh, speaking of things not being the way they seem, fucking Riku! Turns out he's not a prick with amnesia, he's just a fake guy. And like, poo on me, I guess, for not knowing you can just make a fake guy. To quote King George III, I wasn't aware that was something a person 
could do. The Riku replica drama served as another purposeful obfuscation that had me equal parts emotionally invested and totally perplexed. I don't think I'm going out on much of a limb here to suggest that when compared to the rest of the series, Chain of Memories is unmatched when it comes to sheer mystery. I think there's also something to be said about the much more contained and claustrophobic environment that is Castle Oblivion. It can feel a bit disappointing realizing that 90% of the new content in this game is white rooms with floral patterns and we'll get to the not-so-new content, but it paves the way for a much more oppressive and intimate atmosphere. And you know what happens when you strip away interstellar travel and big set pieces and a constant barrage of insulated episodic filler? It forces these characters to talk to each other. Really think about every game with Sora, Donald, and Goofy. How often do they actually talk to each other about what's going on, outside of whatever's happening on a granular Disney World scale? Beyond the first few moments when they're first seen together in any game, how often do they even truly interact with each other in ways that aren't gags or throwaway lines? And I mean, there's always so much shit going on that I almost can't blame them for never taking a moment to chat about the big picture, but in Castle Oblivion, we get to see these characters process what's going on and share their thoughts on the overarching story as it's happening after every single floor. Some conversations are obviously more substantial and consequential than others, but we always get at least a check-in on their interpretation of events and their own theorizing about what's going to happen to them. And I am so distraught that I'm about to say this about Goofy and Donald Goddamn Duck, but it makes them feel, like, more real. It's kind of ironic that the party forgets about the events of this game, because I think all of the conversations they have here serve as the true foundational material for their friendship. I mean, they're close-knit by the end of one, but again, the meaningful interactions they have together over the course of two or three floors already dwarfs the amount of true bonding time they had throughout the entire last game. And the entire next game, frankly. And yet, despite these fairly regular conversations, the game still manages to feel quite lonely, because outside of cutscenes, Sora explores worlds and fights battles on his own, save for the occasional appearance his friends make via cards. So, for me, those reprieves between each floor always felt comforting and especially earned after trekking through an entirely imagined world almost completely on your own. In addition, this relatively limited setting allows for a story that's much more driven by characters and their motivations. It's not so much a grand heroic quest like it usually is in other titles. The stakes in this game, while maybe lower than KH1's in the macro sense, are much more looming and, again, intimate here. There's something a bit scary and real about the questions that Chain of Memories raises, regardless of the truth behind how the forgetting works. What is a person without their memories? What would it mean if your memories felt real but were actually fabrications? Are we better off without certain memories? Would you choose to forget certain unpleasant things even if they had a role in shaping what kind of person you are? Like, it's one thing to put yourself in the hero's big yellow shoes and fantasize about what it would be like to travel the worlds and save the universe, but the dilemmas presented by Chain of Memories always felt so much more personal and human. I mean, in real life, people don't typically have the opportunity to save the world, but people do lose themselves in one way or another. This isn't to devalue what the first game does, but I think there is something inherently more relatable about what the characters in Chain of Memories are dealing with. And you know what's really amusing about all of this? Nomura had already started work on 2 before they decided to make a bridge game between the main titles, and you know what he wanted that bridge game to have? A, quote, lighter tone than the PS2 games. That's what we call a task failed successfully. Alright, I want to take a few minutes to address the non-Castle Oblivion portions of the game, which are usually derided as fairly unremarkable retreads of Cage 1, and I'm mostly inclined to agree. And again, I'm much more lenient about this when looking at the GBA game as opposed to Recom, although it's not like it would have been impossible to feature a handful of new Disney World on a handheld console, but the plot and the story conventions at least explain why we're retreading these things, which is better than nothing. It's a strange blend of experiencing Cage 1 on the go, but also experiencing a ton of new plot points and characters. But I will say, the Disney filler in this game, while less appealing to look at, is thematically more relevant to the overarching narrative than like 90% of the Disney worlds in Cage 2. And don't get me wrong, it's still mostly skip fodder, especially on repeat playthroughs, but on closer examination, the game is often telling you more about its themes and messages in one of its Disney worlds than Cage 2 does in five of its own. I've seen these thematic parallels get brushed aside without much thought by comms detractors as a cheap and easy tie-in, and while that may be true, I would rather have a loose parallel to the overarching narrative than an entirely self-concerned movie rehash. Of course, not every single one is a home run. Agrabah, Monstro, and 100 Acre Wood are just general nods to Sora's searching for his friends and his desire to reunite with the people he cares about. Atlantica and especially Hollow Bastion are a bit more obvious parallels to what's happening in Castle Oblivion. In the case of the latter, you can sub in Sora for Beast, nominate for Belle, and Marluxia for Maleficent. Neverland posits the idea that memories never really go away even if you've seemingly forgotten them. Memories are experiences, and experiences change us, so those experiences are engraved in our hearts in one way or another. Olympus Coliseum serves as a cautionary tale about being manipulated in pursuit of your lost memories, which Sora will promptly fall victim to. As an aside, the Cloud stuff here is also a nice nod to his amnesia and inconsistent memories in Final Fantasy VII. I'd argue he's more appropriately used here than he was in Cage 1 or anywhere else. 
Wonderland is another microcosm of memory manipulation, specifically how false memories can be planted in someone as Alice does with the Queen of Hearts. Kind of interesting that we get to see a hero use this tactic on a villain instead of the other way around, albeit to much less consequence, of course. Halloween Town is my and seemingly everyone's chalk pick for favorite Disney World in this game as it deals with the concept of true memories, and specifically references Sora's agreement with Axel from the first floor. It also features a fittingly unsettling moment where Oogie manages to reawaken his true memories, which sends him into violent hysterics, leading us to speculate what true memories actually are and what power they hold. Sora is given the opportunity to find out, but declines due to the aforementioned deal with Axel. So yes, while these Disney outings at their core are fairly repetitive down to the general plot and visuals, I have to appreciate the effort in tying things together when possible. But I've really buried the lead here because I wanted to save the best for last. You guys are something else. The star of Chain of Memories isn't Sora, or Riku, or Naminé, or the castle. It's the organization. And not Organization 13. we have no idea how many people are in this thing. There's a reason this collective of goth kids took the gaming world by storm. They're incredibly compelling villains, and their debut here remains the peak of their non-existence. And I mean, they're cool and all in Cage 2 and all of their other appearances, but the height of their complexity is Chain of Memories, and it's really no contest. And in reality, it's not a super tall order to come up with a group of villains who are more intimidating than the bottom-feeding Disney baddies and more three-dimensional than darkness-obsessed Ansem S.O.D., but that dramatic contrast definitely helps drive home the point that these guys don't mess around. The organization doesn't just sit around until you show up and then shoot lasers or blow bubbles at you until you beat them. No, they wage constant psychological warfare and engage in emotional manipulation throughout both Sora and Riku's campaigns. Like, these guys have a hostage, and that hostage's situation is dire. As my pal Kiwi once said, being stuck in a room with Marluxia and even worse, Lark's scene is so scary. And their plan isn't to just defeat Sora. No, that would be too merciful. The goal is to rob him of his personhood and turn him into their puppeteer death machine. You know, in this Disney game. And the best part is that we, the audience, get a front row seat to all of this. Some of my favorite cutscenes in the first game were the ones where we got to see what the villains were up to. We get that all the time in Calm, and to a much more entertaining and meaningful effect. I mentioned how I appreciated that the game lets us check in with Sora and company after each world, but I was always 10 times more invested when we got to see what was going on up on the 13th floor, because I want to learn more about these guys. Because, once again, things are not what they initially seem. The antagonists are not one big united front. We've got a lot of politicking and separate allegiances at play here. Okay, so there's this organization. I don't know about you, but I just figured that everyone in the group was at the castle, because why wouldn't they be? Gradually, we come to understand that there's only a handful of operatives here, which this mysterious superior character is not among. And brief aside, I just really like how certain bits of information and chain of memories are hidden from us, specifically when it comes to the organization. It's a little something I'm going to call the George R.R. R. Martin Ulthos phenomenon. Really rolls off the tongue, right? Basically, in A Song of Ice and Fire, most of the story takes place on the continents of Essos and Westeros. But there's this mysterious landmass to the far, far east only ever referenced in supplementary materials called Ulthos. Both the characters and the readers know basically nothing about it. Is it a continent? Is it an island? Its wiki page is shorter than Jiminy Cricket, literally all that's known is that it's covered in jungle. And we're never going to know anything else about it because that's the point. It's fun to speculate and theorize because sometimes imagination is limitlessly cooler than reality. Sometimes world building is served by what is purposefully not shown and kept tucked away in the shadows. As a certain gambler of fate once said, Fun is in not knowing, isn't it? There are sprinkles of Ulthos all over the organization in this game, from references to the superior, who supposedly has something to do with Ansem, to the fact that we don't even know how many people are in this organization. We get to learn their rank numbers by looking at their journal entries, which informs us that there are three more people ranked above Vexen, plus an additional three since Larxene is number 12. And guess what, there were two more even beyond that. Of course, this specific brand of intrigue dries up right quick once we got our hands on Cage 2, but it was a fun year or so wondering what the rest of this mysterious group was like, what elements they're associated with, what weapons they fight with, and where their loyalties lie. That was not as brief of an aside as I anticipated. But speaking of loyalties, let's get back to those factions. While every member of the organization antagonizes Sora and Riku during this game, they also spend a lot of time antagonizing each other. It's a war on multiple fronts here. We've essentially got three factions. Marluxia and Larxene, who are initially presented as half of the known organization until they're eventually revealed to be plotting a coup against the Unseen Superior and the more senior members of the group. Speaking of which, half of those senior members, Vexen, Lexius, and Zexion, aka the Basement Club, are lurking in the castle's lowest levels, keeping tabs on Riku and trying to thwart the disloyal Penthouse crew. In their attempts to do so, they send Vexen to do a bit of double A agenting under the guise of offering help via the Riku replica, although Marluxia sees through this ruse. And here's where Axel comes in. Hello! It's all been said before, but Axel is 
he's just the fucking man. I said that the organization is the star of this game, but the first credit there is Axel. This guy is like a quadruple agent. Chronic backstabbing disorder to the max. He's first presented as being in with the rebels, but we learn from an actual brief aside that he has ulterior motives. Later on, he kills Vexen, because this game just does murder sometimes, basically just to keep up his cover. Because he's really working with the downstairs trio to keep the status quo. He lets Nominate go free and prepares to take down Marluxia once he and Larxene learn of Axel's betrayal. In the name of the organization, I will annihilate you, Axel says. Marluxia points out that this line isn't him, and for good reason, because Axel doesn't give a shit about the organization. He doesn't give two shits either, because later on he figures, hey, I've already got one murder under my belt today, what's one more? And then promptly has Riku Replica drain the life out of Zexion. Axel works for Axel. As the lone surviving organization member, he's the one true loose end of Kam, because we'll come to learn in later games that on the books, he really was sent to CO to deal with the traitors, but not for the sake of upholding Xemnas' status quo. Nope, there's another allegiance hidden underneath all of that in the form of his alliance with Syax and their plan to overthrow the organization themselves. Basically, he went to Castle Oblivion and said, hey, you guys can't topple the regime, I want to topple the regime. Six members of the organization walk into the castle, and one flurry of dancing flames walks out. Don't fret the order of operations and how we got to the end of that math equation, what's really important is the murdering we had along the way. Murder was the true treasure. Hey, so can we talk about the murder? Remember that light tone they were going for here? Tetsuya, what the fuck, dude? What sort of light-hearted, family-friendly programming did you watch growing up? Did I miss the episode of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood where Mr. McFeely kills someone by immolation? I'll double down on my previous statement that Chain of Memories is about as dark as Kingdom Hearts gets. I mean, look at this. This is chilling. Wouldn't you like to be real? Remember beating up Gilbert Gottfried Bird and then sealing silly old Jafar away in a lamp? Let's lighten things up. You know what we need. Characters begging not to be killed. How about a deathbed soliloquy about what happens when we die? You know what, this, this isn't light enough. Let's add in a scene of a little girl being slapped across a room. Oh, and also, you know what makes me feel real safe and warm? When a character finds out they're gonna be lobotomized and then you fade to black as they scream in terror. There. Done. The perfect Disney game. Oh, brother. That's a bit much. As I said up top, Chain of Memories isn't the best game in the series, but I think its importance to the franchise is overlooked, and its narrative, and especially its characters, deserve admiration. Even though the game was created to serve as a bridge between two more substantial titles, Kam is responsible for expanding the Kingdom Hearts universe in an exciting way and introducing a slew of its most interesting characters. In spite of what initial intentions may have been, things got darker and much more complex, but not overbearingly so. It opened the door for ever so slightly more mature storylines that start in this title and continue on into subsequent releases. And despite being a side or bridge game, Kam has an identity and philosophy that is uniquely its own. I don't think any other game in the series really asked the player to, like, ponder the human experience in the way the Chain of Memories does. It exceeded my expectations in 2004, and I still find myself largely impressed by what it accomplished even today. It's one hell of a show. Yo, thanks for watching. Let me know what you thought about my thoughts. As I said, I hardly ever get to talk about Chain of Memories, so I'd love to hear about your experience with the game in the comments. And I'm saying that in a sincere way, not a pander for more engagement way. But speaking of engagement, you guys, I passed 300 subscribers since my last video. That's nuts! 300 people! That's enough people to unrealistically attempt to defeat an ancient Persian army. I've, I've dreamed about having this caliber of support ever since I was just a lad. Thanks so much, genuinely. You're all so nice. And you're all so handsome and pretty too. Or both. You're also very smart. Alright, now, now I'm pandering for engagement. If you like the video, uh, like it. Like the video if you like the video. Uh, subscribe and share my shit. My goal, my goal is to have enough people in my corner to defeat King Xerxes and the Persians. Because uh, 300, you know, it's 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 respectable, it's sizable, it's girthy. But I don't know, if, I don't know if we're taking down the Persians, you know. T tell tell Billy Bob down the street. Tell him I'm recruiting. What's he got going on anyway? Nothing. All right. Thanks for stopping by. Uh, I'll be back with something someday. Maybe it'll be your something. Tell me, tell me if you have a something in mind. I'll consider it. I've done it before, and I'll, I'll do it again. Don't test me. Well, I mean, do test me. Test me by suggesting something. I'm all ears. Alright, this has gone off the rails. Peace out. Ta -ta.